So here's a simple model of scarce ideas. So here, of those three pieces of the innovative process, the fact that you have to identify a market, you have to identify a technological way to fill it, and then you have to invest the resources, the one that's uh, fo the focus here is the second, finding the technological idea to fill the market. So we're assuming the market niche, the first of those is known. And then the scarcity of ideas for how to fill it appears as in the following way. That there are ideas for how to fill the niche, but they arrive at random times to random recipients. So the scarcity is in two ways. We don't have all the ideas for how to do this at any point in time now. And not all of us have those ideas. That uh, one thing that you would like to have is an idea for how to fill an important market niche. So you know, as academics, um, the, the thing that, um, that resonates with many academics is thinking about the fact that you know, every week you read a paper or you have a conversation that creates for you an idea for something to work on. So what do you do with those ideas? Well, one thing you can do with them is give them to your graduate students. In fact, that is the most valuable thing you can give to your graduate students, an idea for something to work on. If you, if you had to decide in terms of what's more costly to you, um, spending two hours explaining to your graduate student um, the calculus of variations, or to give your student the idea behind the best paper you wrote in the last five years, what is the thing that's most valuable to give the student? It's the latter. It's not the former. It's not the resources. It's the idea. And similarly here, the best thing you can have as an entrepreneur um, is an idea either for a market or for how to fill it. It's very scarce. And what, how I'm modeling this here is that these ideas arrive to random people at random times. And when you have it, it's valuable. It's the idea for the investment that's valuable, not the investment itself. So the ideas arrive at a rate lambda, which will be a Poisson rate. And this value of the arrival of ideas lambda is a measure of scarcity. And it's a measure of the scarcity of ideas to the population as a whole. So the idea here is there's a continuum of possible recipients of the idea. One of them will receive each idea, a random person. And because there's a continuum, why, why am I modeling a continuum? Because to make the scarcity idea very stark, I want it to be that you are very unlikely to get two ideas. And that's what this says. So somebody will get an idea. People are getting ideas um, at a rate lambda. When you have it, you better use it. It's the only one you're going to have. And the question is, will you use it? Now, so this model, um, so the, the innovation game continues until some recipient of an idea invests and the game stops. Now, why might the recipient invest or not? The rewards might not be high enough. So there's something about the cost of investing in this market niche. OK, so the elements here are the model distinguishes between ideas for investments, investment opportunities, um, which are scarce, and innovations. But innovations are trivial. Once you have the idea, if you invest the cost, you get the innovation. So the focus here is not on the investment itself. It's on whether or not you use the idea, what you do with the idea. OK. And, the, and we're thinking of ideas as acts of imagination. So what is now the problem of the social planner? What is, in fact, the social problem here? Is there a social problem? Is there a regulation problem for the social planner to solve? After all, intellectual property and every other um, scheme for supporting innovation every other regulation scheme is, in fact, the social planner regulating some economic activity, that is, investment in the economy. So what problem is it here that the social planner wants to solve? So there's a, this is an options model. So if you invest in the first idea that comes along, you're giving up an option to invest in the next idea that comes along, because the premise here is, the premise of this model is, that these, the, 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 these ideas are filling the same market niche. It's not going to be efficient to invest in more than one of them. It's only going to be in, efficient to invest in one of them. And the question is, which one? So that's the planner's problem. And these ideas will come attached to them a cost. And the cost is drawn randomly. So the social problem for the, for the social planner, now whether the social planner can implement this policy is another question. But if the planner could actually observe the cost of these ideas and make a choice, his, the social planner's problem would be to choose a cost threshold 
which would be the maximum cost, sorry, the minimum, this should say maximum, the maximum cost for investing at time t. If there's an idea that occurs at time t, then um, the test would be, is the cost less, to, less than, this, uh, than this cost threshold? And if it is, you should invest. That's the policy. It's the cost threshold. And it doesn't have to be stationary in time. So the planner's problem here, what, in, in choosing this cost threshold, the planner recognizes that by choosing a high cost idea, you're foreclosing the option to invest in a better idea that comes later, because of investing twice has no value. So you're trading off cost versus delay. That's the social planner's problem here. By the way, there are very good historical examples of this sort of thing. Um, my favorite example is um, it's the piston engine for the, the internal combustion engine driving a car, the piston engine. Why in the world would you organize an engine that drives pistons up and down in order to create rotary motion to drive wheels? Think of how inefficient that is. So you have pistons going up and down to drive a, an, to drive an, um, a, ro a rotary um, mechanical device that, that drives the wheels. You have to tra change the up and down motion into, you have to have a, a, a cam or something to change the up and down motion into driving a shaft to drive the wheels. Why would you do that when you can just drive the rotary motion um, directly as in a rotary engine? How did we end up with that? And mechanically, think of all the moving parts. Mechanically, that seems very, very inefficient. Well, when we got around to inventing cars in the late 19th century, we already had the piston engine. We already had pistons from the steam engine. And it was just very easy to adapt it. And that's what happened. And it wasn't until many decades later that somebody thought of the idea, another solution to the same problem, thought of the idea of driving the mechanism directly instead of translating from pistons going up and down into rotary motion. So if we had thought of it at the same time, probably at that time it would have been better to invest in the rotary, uh, the rotary engine instead of the piston engine. But we got stuck because you know, maybe it was the right thing uh, to do it at that, in that order, given the delay that then ensued before we had the rotary engine. Uh, but it's not obvious in advance. So that's the sort of thing I'm thinking about. OK, so if a planner could observe all the ideas at the same time, he would choose the idea with the lowest cost. But he cannot do this precisely because he doesn't observe the ideas. And they arrive randomly. So he doesn't know what they are until someone invests in one. And they arrive randomly. So what does the planner know? He knows the distribution on costs. That is, every time an idea arrives, it arrives with a random cost that's drawn out of some distribution. And he knows the distribution of arrival rates. So he doesn't know the lambda either. He doesn't know the rate at which ideas are arriving. But he starts with some prior on lambda, some, some prior uh, pro probability distribution on lambda. And then he can update it over time. But notice that the planner doesn't know much. This pretty much describes, I think, what goes on in the economy. So what the, what the planner does not know is who received the ideas, whether any of the ideas have been banked. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, you don't use all your good ideas. So when you wake up on Saturday morning and think of a good idea for something to work on, one thing you can do is write it down for your graduate student. Another thing you can do is you can throw it away. And we do that with a lot of ideas. You know, they never come to fruition. We never work on them. But another thing you can do is write down, you know, six sentences about the idea, thinking that sometime you will return to it. So that's what I think of as banking ideas. Not all the ideas have to be thrown away. Some of them can be banked. Now, why might you want to bank an idea? Well, you might want to bank it because eventually the rewards will be higher. Or if you're an academic, you might want to bank it because there might come a day when you don't have something better to work on. That's just a way of saying the cost went down. 